In the late 1800s, at the height of Great Britain's imperialism, the British territory covered almost a quarter of the globe. Southern Africa was a land for the taking, and the seasoned British army was primed for the task, ready to overpower the natives with nine battalions of well-equipped soldiers. But one tribe, the Zulu, was about to stand in their way. The British were not expecting much of a fight and were confident the local people would quickly yield before their superior might and modern artillery. There was a feeling that armed with such weapons, how could anybody defeat the British Army? Surely they were the best in the world. Uh, and certainly a bunch of black men armed with pointy sticks weren't going to, going to get one over on them. But in one battle, by the eerie half-light of a solar eclipse, the Zulus slaughtered 1,300 men, almost an entire column of the British Army. With only 60 soldiers left alive, the English military elite swept the details of this humiliating defeat to the back shelf of history and cast the Zulus as a bloody, primitive tribe that simply got lucky on this one day. The image that has been projected by historians of the Zulu people is that of raging, snarling, bloodthirsty savages out to massacre their enemies. No. No. But myths are hard to undo. And since that day, no one has attempted to decipher how one of the world's most advanced fighting forces could have been wiped out by a tribe of warriors carrying only clubs and spears. Now, a team of ballistics experts, pharmacologists, and archaeologists has been assembled to conduct a forensic examination of the battlefield at Isandlwana. In 1879, a British massacre at the hands of African tribesmen seemed all but inconceivable. Britain was a conquering nation with vast experience battling both the great military empires of Europe and the indigenous peoples of the territories it claimed. Having already established control of India and Egypt, Britain saw southern Africa as its next big conquest. Its army boasted 150,000 soldiers, over 140 battalions, and the most sophisticated military arsenal in the world. Britain's initial presence in South Africa had been cemented in 1815, when it acquired the Cape Colony at the continent's southern tip from the Dutch following the Napoleonic Wars. The shores gave it strategic control of international trade routes, and the country itself offered rich land and valuable diamonds. In the years that followed, the colony expanded, driving the original Dutch settlers into the interior. By the 1870s, the British forces were reaching north into the land of the Zulus. Here, they expected to find little resistance, but the Zulus had a strong military tradition dating back to the days of the legendary King Shaka and could amass an army of 20,000 warriors. The self-assured British were in for a surprise. The massacre at Isan Luana would be a rude awakening. This was really the worst defeat suffered by the British Army during the Victorian era. All the commanding officers were killed. Uh, nobody who fought on foot in this battle actually got away uh, at all. It was extremely apocalyptic in terms of, uh, of the casualty roll. Uh, really, the camp was wiped out, and almost nobody lived to tell the tale. The devastation was discovered on January 22nd, 1879 when troops who had been out looking for the Zulus arrived on the scene. At the base of Isandwana mountain, they found the camp they had left that morning, burning and littered with the bloody remains of over 1,300 fellow soldiers. The battlefield was carpeted in dead men and dead animals. Somebody says that you couldn't put a foot a yard in any direction without stepping over a dead body. Of course, most of the British bodies had been disemboweled uh, by the Zulus in accordance with their ritual practices. 
people lay down to sleep, waking up in the morning to find that they'd been lying next to corpses. So they had the most ghastly night here, which, as somebody said, stretched their nerves almost to breaking point. One of the dead was Sergeant Thomas Cooper. Among his private papers, which were recently found in a family attic, was an impersonal letter from the British Army. For historian Ian Knight, the letter sparked a strong personal desire to have the battle re-examined. Sergeant Cooper was his great uncle. There were a, a small and very poignant collection of papers uh, relating to this family death. A couple of memorial cards, a couple of photographs of him in uniform, and a very, very brief message written to Sergeant Cooper's sister by one of his commanding officers. And it had clearly been written by a regimental clerk who presumably had eight or nine hundred of these to, to fill in. Uh, and it said, Dear blank, I regret to inform you that your blank was killed on the 22nd of January last. I regret I cannot give further or fuller information. And obviously the officer had gone through and filled in the details of, in this case, it was your brother. Um, and put the details at the end of where he was killed uh, and signed it at the end. The details were sparse because the British did their best to gloss over the defeat. With so few survivors to file reports and only a smattering of accounts from Zulu warriors, what really happened that day is shrouded in mystery. But now Ian Knight has joined forces with forensic archaeologist Tony Pollard to determine exactly what happened that day. What we have to remember is that so few men survived this battle that the eyewitness accounts that are actually written down are very sparse and few and far between. If we view ourselves, if you like, as sort of forensic scientists looking at a crime scene, if you can call a battle a crime, um, and look at the physical remains and through those physical remains through their distribution across the field start to tell the story from a different angle from the angle of objects that have been dropped during the course of that battle the most obvious place to start is beneath the stone cairns that mark the spots where the British troops fell one soldier is found near the banks of the Manzanyama River he had been pursued for two miles over rocky ground before he was finally brought down. For Ian Knight, the grave brings to life the bloody truth about how his great uncle had died. I found it quite a moving experience to be delving amongst the bones of men who were killed here, looking on the face of my own dead relative. Uh, and I think certainly it, it's brought home the horror of this particular battle to me in a way that written accounts, even though you, you read them all the time when you're studying it, um, never quite does. The graves have been looted by scavengers and badly eroded by the intense heat, but there are still a few remains to be found. It's a piece of occipital bone here, which is the back of the head, which is just about here. It's quite a thick, thick bone. That's probably why it survived so well, so close to the surface. Um, we've also got a piece of petrous temporal here, which is actually a bone from inside the skull. The inner ear bones are inside this piece of bone. And then we found just about half an hour ago, we found a whole tooth. It's quite a, a large molar. Unfortunately, the bones reveal little about the battle. But the white cairns positioned along what is known as the Fugitive's Trail are a useful lead. Like the chalky outlines of victims at a murder scene, the cairns pinpoint the exact spots where the British soldiers were cut down. Right, we're just below the saddle with the mountain on the, the left there. And this is where the fugitives started to spill back from the camp as the thing started to go dreadfully wrong as the firing lines broke up and men started to retreat back into the camp. The choreography and the history of this battle is actually marked out in the landscape. As far away as the front firing lines, you'll start to come across white cairns. And we also know that the fugitives trail takes the route it does because it's mapped out physically 
with these cairns. And you can see the first slot here. These poor guys didn't get very far off the saddle at all before they were hit and actually go all the way down toward the river, which was the ultimate aim of these guys. A few men got across there, but most of them ended up under these cairns. From written accounts of the day and the physical evidence from the ground itself, the course of the battle can be charted. The Zulus had gathered above the British camp and then executed a precision encircling maneuver they called the Horns of the Bull. This is a simplified version of the Zulu attack on the British camp at Isant Luana. Here's our Isant Luana mountain. Here's the Ngutu or Inyoni ridge. Here's the British camp stretched out across the foot of the mountain. Now the Zulu commanders were up on an escarpment on the edge of the Inyoni here, which gave them a very good commanding view of the whole battlefield area. And the Zulu right horn comes round from behind the ridge here, sweeps round the back of Isant Luana. The left horn comes round on this side and sweeps round that way. And the chest, the main body, comes over the ridge itself and advances straight at the British camp. Now the British are driven from their advanced positions in front of the camp back through it by the chest. And as they do so, so the horns come in and almost cut them off on either side. And the last remnants are driven down this broken area, which we call the Fugitives Trail, across some very wild country until they end up here on the banks of the Manzimnyama River, where the last groups are brought to bay and wiped out. The most obvious explanation for the defeat is that 1,600 British soldiers were simply outnumbered by 20,000 Zulus. But theoretically, the Redcoat's state-of-the-art Martini Henry rifles should have been able to keep even such a large enemy force at bay. At the National Army Museum in England, vintage Martini Henrys are tested to determine their effectiveness. Right, this is a Martini Henry rifle, which is .45 calibre. This is a bullet for Martini Henry, 45 calibre and weighs 480 grains of lead. Uh, the Martini Henry rifle in, in ideal conditions was probably the most effective weapon the British Army has seen for many years. It's like having a, a modern fighter plane or tank. This was the first breech-loading gun. In optimal conditions, highly trained redcoats could fire about 10 rounds a minute. At that rate, even if they only hit their target every other shot, they should have been able to wipe out the Zulu army in under six minutes. And there's a penetration hole. The rounds just gone straight on and through the Zulu as well. The rifle's maximum range was 1,400 yards. Clean as anything. British military analysts estimated that given the rocky terrain and the weight of their weapons, the African warriors would have been within rifle range for at least 13 crucial minutes before reaching the British front line. Yep, that should be okay. Should be able to get that, shouldn't you? Ballistic soap is prepared to the same thickness as a human body and has the same density as human flesh. It demonstrates the penetrative power of the Martini Henry rifle. Look at that, Roger. The size of the entry wound compared to the bullet, it's twice the diameter. God, look at that. No, it's bigger than a 50 pence piece. It is. It's gone straight for that Zulu and for another one. The test seemed to support the faith the British had in their weapons. With the Martini Henry rifle on their side, the British should have been able to fend off the Zulu attack. So how else can the defeat be explained? One British survivor had suggested that ammunition may not have been reaching the front line. The argument runs that over-officious British quartermasters refused to issue ammunition at the crucial times. Um, bit of a tradition in British military history to blame the quartermaster if something goes wrong. Uh, and therefore the British were unable to get fresh supplies through to their firing line at the height of the battle. And that this created a lull in their firing which the Zulus were able to exploit to overcome the British positions. But the team is sceptical. 
Evidence from the battlefield reveals that the ammunition was reaching the troops. This is a...